Hi there, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle and your host, Larry Erickson. Here I am. Uh, and for the next half hour, I'm going to be rattling on about things that you really should know about. Uh, comments, questions, reactions to the show are always invited, always encouraged. Uh, you can email me. The email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. Uh, and that is my, uh, my personal email. And if for some reason you didn't catch that, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and you can uh, leave a comment there or get the email address from there. Uh, the only things I ask, if you, if you do send me email, is that you include something in the subject line so it's clear that this is not spam, you know, refers to the show in some way, and uh, be a little patient about getting an answer because I'm lousy at answering email. But you will get an answer. That you can be sure of. We're going to start, as I always like to start, with some good news. And I got four bits of good news this week. Um, the, first, the first bit is that Florida is now the 36th state where you can get married without regard to the gender of the person you love. 70% of Americans now live in states where same-sex marriage is legal. Now in Florida, this came in two quick waves. Uh, it starts back in July. Florida Circuit Judge Sarah Zabel, or Zabel, Zabel I believe it is, she declared that the state's ban on same-sex marriage violates the U.S. Constitution. Now she's a state judge and that ruling only applied to her jurisdiction, which is Miami-Dade County. She put uh, her ruling on hold pending appeal, as is common. On January 5th, she lifted the stay, meaning same-sex couples in Miami-Dade County could start getting married immediately. She then marked the occasion by marrying the two women who brought the original suit. Now, there may have been a touch of vanity, a touch of, you know, I want to be involved in this, uh, in Judge Zabel's decision to act just when she did. Because, you see, the month after she made her ruling in July, in August, uh, federal district court judge Robert Hinkle also found Florida's ban on same-sex marriage to be unconstitutional. Now, he stayed his order until January 6th to allow time for appeals. Uh, Pam Bondi, who's the Attorney General of Florida, went to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals and then to the Supreme Court looking for an order to get the stay extended. She lost both times. So the order was to expire on January 6th, which means the bell acted actually just hours before Hinkle's stay was to expire. Uh, and, uh, but come midnight, it did. And same-sex marriage became legal in the entire state of Florida, and that is good news. There's a footnote to this. Jeb Bush raised a rhetorical white flag over this, but others weren't so ready to face reality, so much so that uh, shortly before his ruling expired, Judge Hinkle felt it necessary to clarify his ruling that it applied to the entire state, not just to the county where the original case arose. And it could only be considered an act of childish petulance. At least three counties in Florida have put an end to the practice of people getting married at the courthouse. This so that their clerks don't have to worry about getting cooties from uh, doing same-sex weddings. Okay, our second bit of good news actually starts about two years ago. That's when the governor of Maryland, Martin O'Malley, uh, convinced the Maryland State Legislature to put an end to the death penalty in that state. Unfortunately, this change was not retroactive, which means that four people who were, uh, had been convicted of murder and were on death row, uh, that they were not affected by the change. The good news here is that in one of his final acts as governor, O'Malley has commuted those death sentences to life without parole. Uh, and by doing that, he's actually closing the books on the death penalty in the state of Maryland. His successor, Larry Hogan, says that it's unlikely he will ask the legislator, legislature rather, to reinstate the death penalty. Eighteen states and Washington, D.C. have now banned the death penalty, uh, six of those states in the last seven years, which of course unfortunately means that 32 states and the feds still have the uh, death penalty on their books, but even in those places it's being used less and less. Only 35 people were murdered at law in 2014, the fewest in 20 years. Only 72 were sentenced to death in 2014, the fewest in 40 years. Uh, 
And of those executed in 2014, just three states, Florida, Missouri, and Texas, accounted for 80% of them. The death penalty is slowly, too slowly, way too slowly, but it is slowly disappearing from the United States. So maybe at some point we can join the more than 100 other nations, including essentially the entire industrialized world and much of the rest of the world, in tossing this symbol of savagery, this badge of barbarism, into the dustbin of history where it belongs. And that would be extra good news. All right, our third bit of good news, um, and this is one I bet you have not heard about. On Christmas Eve, the United Nations Arms Trade Treaty went into effect. This treaty is an effort to put some sort of controls on the $80 billion a year trade, international trade, in the machinery of death. Until recently, very little attention was paid to the trade in conventional arms, um, a trade that actually served mostly to arm terrorists, both government and non-government terrorists, and oppressors, both government and non-government oppressors, served mostly to arm them while enriching a crowd of shadowy arms dealers um, who cut the deals and handled the details. To show you how poorly this trade has been regulated, of the 7 to 8 million firearms that are manufactured annually, 1 million of them are lost to illegal arms sales. Now, the principle of the Arms Trade Treaty is simple enough. It prohibits the sale of weapons to individuals, groups, or countries that commit genocide, that violate human rights or international humanitarian laws, uh, that abet terrorists. Uh, and it requires nations to monitor, uh, to monitor all aspects of production of weapons from sourcing to manufacture to export and applies to a wide range of conventional weapons, everything from guns and grenades to tanks and battleships. It is the result of these things invariably are of years of negotiation, but ultimately the uh, United Nations General Assembly approved it by a vote of 154 to 3. Only Iran, North Korea, and Syria voted no. In 2013, some 130 countries, including the United States, signed it. Over 60 countries have ratified it, well beyond the 50 needed to make it binding on all of the signatories. Now, can a treaty like this have an impact? Because it's easy to dismiss these kind of things as just feel-good measures that lack any teeth to actually enforce and achieve their laudable goals. But the fact is, history says treaties like this can make a difference. For example, in 1999, an international treaty to ban the use of anti-personnel mines went into effect. Within five years, the legal trade in such weapons was almost non-existent and 65 nations had entirely destroyed their stocks of anti-personnel mines. The number of accidental deaths from exploding landmines has been cut by over two-thirds. Meanwhile, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty has essentially put an end to the testing of nuclear weapons, and the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty has undeniably all but halted the spread of nuclear weapons technology. So yes, treaties like this can make a difference, which the fa means that the fact that it has gone into effect, that's good news. It would be better news, of course, if the U.S. Senate would ratify it, which of course it won't. Why? Because of the freaking paranoid gun nuts and their bought off stooges in the Senate, 50 of who sent a letter to Obama in September saying they opposed the treaty because it infringed on the sacred rights under the Second Amendment. This even though the treaty is exclusively concerned with foreign trade, international trade, not domestic trade, and in fact the U.S. requirements for obtaining a license to export weapons is already stricter than the treaty requires. These people are just unbelievable and unbelievably vile. All right, our last bit of good news for this week. Uh, with all that's facing us as a people, and with all the grandiose claims the right-wingers have made about all the things that they are going to accomplish now that they are in control of Congress, what did they start off with? What was the very first thing they introduced, the thing that they really wanted to get done as quick as possible, the thing that they thought was so important that they introduced it within hours of Congress convening? A bill to approve the Keystone XL pipeline. 
the one designed to carry tar sands, which are about the most polluting form of oil there is, uh, from Canada to refineries in Texas. Now, I've gone over the reasons for rejecting this monstrosity, gone over the lies of its proponents several times. I won't bother doing that again here. What I will say is that the good news about this is that shortly after that bill was introduced, White House media representative Josh Earnest stated that Obama will veto this bill if it passes the Congress. Now, he couched the veto in narrow terms, citing the, uh, the fact that there is a, the issue of the pipeline's route through Nebraska is still before that state's Supreme Court, but the fact is, he said it. Now, all along, I've been wondering if Obama's repeated stalling on making a final decision on Keystone XL uh, was because he wanted to approve it, but was afraid of backlash from his base, which includes the environmental community, or because he wanted to reject it, but was afraid of backlash from energy corporations and conservative electorates in states where Democrats were trying to hold on to their seats. At this point, I don't know how much of the stall was in a futile attempt to protect Democrats, but at least it does appear, at least for now, it does appear that Barack Obama is leaning toward rejecting the Keystone XL pipeline. And that's good news. All right, we now come to one of our regular features. It's the Clown Award, given as always for meritorious stupidity. And that's what it's for, for meritorious stupidity. But I'll mention that sometimes because the stupidity involved has a real direct impact on people's lives, sometimes the clown of the word is actually kind of serious. Um, not this time. This time we got two clown awards, and they are both just for a simple purpose of mocking stupidity. Uh, the first one, in fact, you may have heard about this. This story was picked up by the Washington Post. It was on the Rachel Maddow Show. It was on the BBC. It was trending on Twitter. So you may have actually come across this. But just in case you haven't. Our first big red nose goes to Kirby DeLouter. He's a member of the city council of Frederick County, uh, the county council, rather, of Frederick County, Maryland. He was a bit player in a news story in a local paper about a dispute between another council member and the county administrator over the distribution of parking spaces for council members. But uh, DeLauder had a, re, a dislike for the reporter who did the story, and he used this opportunity to go on Facebook and denounce her for her, quote, unauthorized use, unquote, of his name, Kirby DeLauder, and to demand that she never again use his name, Kirby DeLauder, without his express authorization. When she replied that no such authorization is necessary, especially for a public official, Kirby DeLauder answered, quoting, use my name again, unauthorized, and you'll be paying for a lawyer. That's right. Public official Kirby DeLauder thinks that if a news article in any way relates to Kirby DeLauder, the paper must get the permission of Kirby DeLauder in order to use the name of Kirby DeLauder. Kirby DeLauder, who name, whose name appears in print as Kirby DeLauder, is a champion clown. All right, our other big red nose this week uh, goes to City Councilor Bud Williams of Springfield, Massachusetts. Last month, he was together with about 150 other people, including some other town officials, in Court Square in Springfield to participate in a traditional holiday seasonal event in town, one that's been going on for about 35 years now. In his remarks to all present, Williams declared that Jesus is the reason for the season, which, as I pointed out in my show on why Christmas is on December 25th, he isn't and he never was. The season was about celebrating the winter solstice, celebrations which far predate Christianity. But that doesn't make Williams a clown. It merely makes him uninformed. No, he wins the big red nose this week because the Springfield tradition involved the occasion for him to declare and we, what he called a positive contribution, the occasion for him to declare Jesus is the reason for the season, was the lighting of a menorah to start the mark, mark the start of Hanukkah. That, my friends, is some powerful stupid. The thing that I'm positive about is that Bud Williams is a clown. And we're taking a break. <music> 
and here we are back again. And we're going to start this part of the show with uh, one of our occasional features. It's called the Hero Award, and it's given for people who just do the right thing on a matter big or small. Back in June, I had an outrage of the week uh, about the attack on the press, uh, press freedom that was represented by the Supreme Court saying that federal prosecutors could force New York Times reporter James Risen to testify about his source for a story. Now, those prosecutors have charged Jeffrey Sterling, a former CIA case officer, with leaking classified information related to a botched attempt by the spooks to disrupt Iran's nuclear industry. Risen had written about the program. Prosecutors became convinced that Sterling was Risen's source and are demanding that he break his confidence, uh, his promise rather, of confidentiality to his source and confirm on the stand under oath that Sterling was the one who leaked the information to him. Risen faces a contempt of court citation and a prison sentence of literally indeterminate length if he refuses. On Monday, January 5th, Risen appeared at a pretrial hearing in federal court and did just that. He refused. Finally, the federal prosecutor asked Risen if his position was that, quoting the prosecutor, regardless of any threat of sanctions, you would not testify as to the identity of the source or sources who provided the information that Sterling is accused of, of leaking. Risen's answer was yes. And in that one word, he reaffirmed what he has said all along. He will go to prison rather than reveal a source. And in that one word, too, he claimed his status as a hero. You know, all right, something else uh, I've been talking about a lot, and I'm going to talk about more here. On Friday, December 26th, the day after Christmas, a person with a gun terrorized the neighborhood of Chattanooga, Tennessee. They're wearing body armor, and they drove around in the neighborhood firing their gun at people and cars. When the cops found the shooter at a church parking lot, the shooter took off in their car, leading police on a high-speed chase to an intersection where the shooter pointed their gun at the cops. Now, you, you know what happened next, of course. Yeah, that's right. They were taken into custody without incident or injury. Why? Because this is who did it. Or if I'm going to be legally accurate, is who is alleged to have done it. Her name is Julia Shields. She is 45 years old, and most importantly, she is white. She's been charged with multiple felony charges, including attempted murder, but she is alive, despite actually having an actual gun, actually shooting it at people, and actually pointing the gun at a cop. She's still alive. Is anyone out there, anyone out there going to try to seriously argue to me if she had been a black woman or even more a black male? Is anyone seriously going to argue to me that in that case, that person would still be alive? Is anybody out there going to seriously try to argue to me that if it had been a black male doing the same thing, that their car would not have been ripped to shreds with bullets and their body would not have been ripped to shreds the same way? There is a group of mostly young twits in Texas who have taken to confronting cops on the streets armed with video cameras and assault rifles trying to provoke the cops in some way that they claim will reveal police brutality the better they say to expose and stop it. They are, of course, all white. Is anyone out there seriously going to try to argue to me that if an armed young black man got into a confrontation with a cop that that young man would be able to walk away with nothing worse than a tongue lashing about respect instead of winding up lying in a pool of their own blood? Anybody seriously going to try to argue that? Is there anyone out there who's going to seriously try to claim that this guy, his name is Corey Watkins, is anybody out there trying to claim that this guy was black, that that store he's in would not be swarming with cops screaming, put the gun down, and maybe if he was lucky, giving him two seconds to comply before opening fire. Time that they did not give to John Crawford III to put down the toy gun he was carrying in, a, in an aisle in a Walmart in Ohio before they shot him dead. Now, yes, this guy's in Texas. That's an open carry state. 
What he's doing actually is technically is legal. Texas is an open carry state. Do you think that would have made a difference? If you do, you should know that Ohio is also an open carry state, and that fact did not help John Crawford. You may think, as I'm sure that some of you do, that I've been going on about too much, going on too much about this of late. But frankly, as long as Corey Watkins can walk without fear, without fear, can walk around with a loaded AK-47 on his shoulder, while 12-year-old Tamir Rice can be shot down literally in less than two seconds because of a plastic toy, and Romain Brisbane can be shot and killed because a cop thought a pill bottle in his pocket was a gun, I say we haven't gone on about it nearly enough. All right, moving on from there for our other regular weekly feature, this is the Outrage of the Week. According to a new study by the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, roughly one million of the nation's poorest people will lose their food stamps over the course of 2016. Food stamps, by the way, are now properly called SNAP, which stands for Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, but most everybody still calls them food stamps. The problem here arises out of the 1996 welfare reform law. Remember that? The one under Bill Clinton that was going to end welfare as we know it? That law said that unemployed adults aged 18 to 50 who are not disabled or raising minor children can't get SNAP benefits for more than three months in any 36-month period. Now, the law created an exception for those who uh, are in a work or training program for at least 20 hours a week, but the bill did not require states to create such programs, and most of them didn't, which means for most of the affected people, these so-called exceptions do not exist. What's more, there is no exception for an inability to find work. So these individuals will lose their benefits after three months, no matter how hard they are trying to find work. Now, under that, waivers could be granted for states to skip the three-month limit if the state's unemployment was high enough. During the Great Recession, most states got such waivers. But with declining unemployment, those waivers are now expiring in the 40 states that still have them, and surprise, surprise, Congress is in no mood to extend them. The impact on the folks affected by this loss of this waiver will be severe. Agriculture Department data show that 82% of the people subject to the three-month limit have average monthly incomes of no more than half the poverty line. And even more shockingly, as a group, as a group, their average monthly income is about 19% of the poverty line. Not 19% below the poverty line, 19% of the poverty line, less than a fifth of the poverty line. And these people typically qualify for no other sort of income support. Hitting these people with the loss of food assistance, averaging $150 to $200 a month per person, not might, it will cause severe hardship among these people. They will go hungry, period. Now, there are a lot of things Congress could do about this. It could restore the funding that was cut last year. It could extend the waivers. It could make the waivers permanent. Hey, I know the waiver is supposed to be temporary to deal with an economic situation, but that was also true with those famous Bush-era tax cuts, and that didn't keep them from being made permanent, did it? But Congress isn't going to do that. In fact, no one, not even among the so-called liberals in Congress, is even talking about doing any of that. But the real reason, the real reason this won't happen is that Congress is now in the grip of ideologically driven fruitcakes who won't do anything to help the poor, not because of small government, not because of cut the budget, not because of reduced taxes, but because they simply just don't care. And that's something I'm going to be coming back to, but for now I'm just going to say it is genuinely a moral, ethical outrage. Finally, for the show this week, um, I'd tell you that... Um, I met a cat. 
cat's name is Shadow. I'm not quite sure where the name came from, but the cat's name is Shadow. And I met this cat. And the thing that I noticed about this cat, the uh, very first thing I noticed, was how loud this cat was. Um, not just her meow, but her purr. Uh, how insistent she was about getting attention. How no amount of holding was ever enough. No amount of petting was ever too much. <laughs> In other words, I met this cat and discovered she's a pest. A very sweet, affectionate, lovable pest, but a pest. A pest of the sort that you had to chase away in order to finally go to sleep, only to wake up later and find her under the covers and purring as soon as she realized you were awake. That was 10 years ago. She died last night. It wasn't a surprise. We knew she was failing. She'd been failing for months. She'd lost her meow, in fact, and she started keeping to herself for the most part. Um, she pretty much stopped grooming herself. I mean, she'd be content and she'd purr if you picked her up. If you went to and picked her up and held her, but she didn't come looking for intention the way she had almost her entire life. She was drinking little and eating less. There were a couple of times we thought that she wouldn't make it through the night, but she always did until last night. Um, and the embarrassing thing for me here, I at one time made my living as a photographer and I do not have a picture of her to show you. So I'm gonna have to try to describe her so you get some sense of what she looked like. She was a Persian short hair mix. Those cats, you see them around, like they're American short hairs but they're very fluffy. They got a nice thick coat. She was a tricolor, but she wasn't calico. She was mostly brownish gray with some black, streaks of black and a few flecks of actual gray in her. And uh, she was not quite 16 years old. And that was Shadow. Uh, I've, <laughs> I've known, Sh my wife had Shadow before I met her. So I've known Shadow as long as I've known my wife. Um, and even though it wasn't, ex even it wasn't a surprise, even it wasn't a surprise, um, people who don't have pets don't understand how much of a pet is part of your family. They don't understand how much a part of your life that animal is. And Shadow was a part of our lives, part of my life for 10 years. So I just wanted to say, R.I.P. Shadow. Have the best week you possibly can. We'll see you next week. Peace.